So we're on Joshua 17. Uh, last week was Ephraim. The week before that, we talked about Joseph. I'm um, going to bring that in a bit today with Joseph and Ephraim uh, because we're still in the family of Joshua, of Joseph. And I um, wanted to share something with you today on the topic. So what you're going to f- see as I continue going through uh, the slides, um, I'm going to make references to people in the Bible. Um, that's done on purpose. I won't have enough time to really go into each and every single person. Uh, that is there as kind of examples of women in the Bible. Now, I'm going to give you a little back story about, about me concerning uh, what we're talking tonight. So I was born in a household of five children, uh, youngest of five. We were all brought up by our mother. Um, mom and dad had a, had a divorce, so mom had to raise the kids on her own. In a town where people don't necessarily go to college, all her children did. Um, and she had a good career. Uh, she retired a couple years ago, about five years ago now, actually. And the things that she went through growing up, the things that she went through as, as a woman, as a mother, as a wife, some very hard stuff to get through, let alone raising up children, taking them to, to practices and, and school and whatnot. My wife and I, we just have the one, and he's a handful. And we're expected another in January, February time frame, uh, a girl. And so for me, as, as, uh, as, a, as a pastor just starting out church planting, it was easy for me to see as a father what things I can pass down to my son. But now with a girl, I found it kind of interesting. It's the same stuff. The same stuff. It might be a little different with certain topics covered. But that's why there's a woman in the house. So that's, w- that's where my wife comes in as the mother role to be that mother figure, and for me to be that father figure. And this has been designed from the, begin- the beginning of time that there is a mom and there is a father in the household. And I-, I can tell you from experience what it's like when you don't have either one. Because now I see it with my son, who has both mom and both dad at home, together in union, with God. Keep in mind when we're going through Joshua, the, it's not the 21st century. So the way their culture is done is different from, from our culture. There are cultures within our culture that would be dominantly patriarchal or, or matriarchal. In my family I come from Because of circumstances, the mom is the leader. The mom wears the pants, so to speak. The mom is the provider. And this 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 is what happens when you don't have a father figure in the household for whatever reason. But still God works with us. Still God is looking to help the children of the family. Still God is looking to have us as parents pass down our wisdom, our knowledge, our our experience of life to pass it down. So from the beginning of time, God has been after a relationship with us. He created us, man and woman, in the garden Because of Adam and Eve's disobedience, sin entered. All descendants of Adam and Eve have the curse of sin. God had chosen Abraham and his wife Sarah to usher in a nation of people who would devote themselves to God and abide in in him as best as they could so that God could get us to a point 
where we can be saved for all time, getting us back to the garden where there is no sin curse. God has used Abraham, his sons, Moses, and here in Joshua to bring upon events that would lead to the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ. Here in chapter 17, our passage, starting with verse 1. Then the allotment was made to the people of Manasseh, for he was the firstborn of Joseph. To the Machir, the firstborn of Manasseh, the father of Gilead, were allotted Gilead and Bashan, because he was a man of war. And then the allotments were made to the rest of the people of Manasseh by their clans, Abazir, Helek, Azrael, Shechem, Hefer, and Shemida. These were the male descendants of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, by their clans. Now, Hefer, you can circle that, because we're going to be talking about a person who comes from that clan. In verse 3, now, Zelophehad, the son of Hefir, son of Gilead, son of Machir, son of Manasseh, had no sons, but only daughters, and these are the names of his daughters. Mela, Noah, Hagla, Milka, Tirzah. They approached Eliezer, the priest, and Joshua, the son of Nun, and the leaders, and said to them, the Lord commanded Moses to give us an inheritance along with our brothers. So according to the mouth of the Lord, he gave them an inheritance among the brothers of their father. Thus there fell to Manasseh ten portions besides the land of Gilead, and Bashan, which is the one other side of the Jordan, because the daughters of Manasseh received an inheritance along with his sons. The land of Gilead was allotted to the rest of of the people of Manasseh. So you here you have a group of women who have come to the leader of the group, Joshua, and are saying, hold on, you're giving all this stuff to, to these, my, my brothers, to these men. What about us women? What about us? And what is going on here is the land of inheritance. There are, the allotment is going on. So to Manasseh gets this portion, that portion, but Zelophehad didn't have any sons, only daughters. So the breakdown here is you have what is the land inheritance, which is passed down. So God calls Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 to leave his home and go into the land of Canaan. There God makes a promise to Abraham that all of the land will go to Abraham and his descendants. Then chapter 15, you have that covenant. It's reaffirmed, the promise made to Abraham. And it's also included there, descendants. You'll have an heir, you'll have a son. Also the promised land of Canaan, just as God promised in chapter 12. And Isaac, who's next in line, keeps that promise going. Jacob keeps that promise going. The 12 sons of Jacob, they keep that promise going. Moses honors that, that the promise of the land inheritance and keeps it going through his actions. Joshua honors the promise and fulfills it by overseeing the allotments to the 12 tribes which we are in, that inheritance. So the daughters here, they're saying, what about us? And it's interesting um, this actually brings me to another thing I wasn't sure I was going to talk about, but a couple years ago, about five, six years ago, I was working for an organization, and part of this organization was to increase membership. And we went and we, uh, we held ourselves up into a, a church where we invited all these families to come in, and we talked to them, and we got them in, enrolled into the program. Um, what was interesting was there was nothing but women doing the registration. And uh, I thought it was pretty cool to see these, these women leaders. 
And then I met one of their leaders who came in, and, and one of the women had a question about how we sign up, how we register uh, the online portion, billing, um, and, and just getting people trained. And the leader overseeing these group of women, this man came and he just kind of took this packet from me as I was sitting down with one of his female leaders, and she kind of just closed up. And I didn't know who the man was. I stood up. I said, excuse me, how can we help you? And he gave me his whole title and his office. And, but he was nowhere on our registrar. So we had another person come in, a commissioner, to figure what's going on. Long story short, these women didn't want to lead. Uh, they, some of them had full-time jobs, and some of them were being pressured by this whole organization to, to get them to do this thing, to, to lead. And as we were talking to the gentleman, me and my commissioner and chairman, we were uh, pretty much saying, can you, can you sit here and let's, you know, go through this, see what's going on. And me, just sticking to the letter, this is how we register. We need your information. We need your signature now. There was a refusal to give me his signature. And as the conversation carried, the woman started to cry. You can see the tears coming down. Right away, I knew there's something going on. So another gentleman from our leadership team came and said, can we take this matter outside? And as a, all the men stood up, about five, six of us, we walked out the doors. I said, hey, but what, what about these couple leaders who are registering? They should be part of this conversation. He said, oh, them? No. One of my leaders said, I don't want to deal with people who look down on women like this. I'm leaving. And another leader did the same thing. So we tried to work out this predicament that we were in because we knew that the tail end of this where were these youth who whatever thing, everything the leaders did, they would get the benefit of it. And we weren't working towards their benefit. So me and my other commissioner did our best to work with this agency, this organization. Next week, I think it was like a Monday or Tuesday, I was called into our offices, and uh, I was there to represent what had gone on. And sure enough, this is something that happens a lot. I remember thinking, I really am blessed to have been raised the way I was. To have some diversity and awareness that men and women, we, we all have skill sets. We all have things that are very much in common. If I'm physically strong in one area, my, my wife at home is strong in other areas. And together we make a team, we make it work. I just couldn't understand how this whole agency could, could do this and, and be so subtle about it. When I was reading this part here, the daughters coming forth to Joshua saying, what about us? Given their day in context, there wasn't none of that going on so much. They, Joshua was like, you're right. You're right. That's a difference between a man of God, a man of faith, and a man of the world, or a person of the world. You look down on people, you stomp on them, because for whatever reason. The issues that they were faced with in their day, completely different than what we're faced with today, 
But there's a lot of parallels going on about that. How you choose to live your life in accordance with God or in accordance with the world. You're going to get distractions. You're going to get twisted. You're going to get manipulated. You're going to get different sides of the story. None of it makes sense. You're going to have these twisted presuppositions that men, women, all evil, no one deserves to be saved. And that's a world that can be difficult to bring Christ into the picture. It can be difficult for Christians to go and love on someone, to tell the truth, to speak the truth, to exemplify it. And here Joshua doesn't buckle. Jo- Joshua doesn't say, no, you're women. No. Joshua sees the importance of the children of God. There's other things going on here. See, these, these daughters, not only are they in the, the, the children of God family, but they belong to a family that was beloved by Joseph, beloved by Jacob. They were given what was called a double portion, which I went over a couple weeks ago. And I want to read to you, actually, we can go back to this. don't know if I have time. It's a whole chapter, and we get to see the breakdown of that double portion. The firstborn, which is Reuben, did something ridiculous. His father called him out and said, no, you're not going to get the double portion. You're not going to get the firstborn stuff. And in that, before that, actually, throughout Genesis chapter 48, Jacob is talking to Joseph saying, basically, you're, you're the one I love. You're the one that got screwed up the most because your brothers try to kill you and so many other things. I'm going to give you the best. I'm going to give you the firstborn double portion. So we get that half-tribe of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh. So that starts way back when, Genesis 48. And as you can see here, Reuben is uh, bottom right-hand corner. Manasseh is brown top and middle, light brown. They got big land, much so than the firstborn. So the daughters are part of this inheritance. So they're not just going to get some small corner of an empty space. They're part of that double portion. Everyone knows it. Everyone knows the story, the people of God. And up to that point, it was all these men who were given their firstborn inheritance to their firstborn sons. And if there wasn't a firstborn son, typically, like we saw in, you've seen Abraham, someone of the household was going to get the inheritance. But God said, no, you and Sarah are going to have a son, and that inheritance is going to go through them. And since then, it's been... If I have a son, he gets inheritance. If he has a son, he gets the inheritance. It became a cultural thing. So it's very important that when we look at this passage, how the daughters came to Joshua, and Joshua recognized the promise there, honoring it, given it to them, there's other things being played out. There's a conversation that happened when Moses was around. I'm going to turn to that page now. I'm going to read it for you guys. It's in Numbers 36. 
And when I read this, I thought, how important is it to, to know and understand that they had thought about this? What if there were no sons? What if there were just daughters? And then what would those daughters be, be uh, influenced by, or what would be some conflicts there? So here in Numbers chapter 36, verse 1, the heads of the fathers, houses of the clan of the people of Gilead, the son of Machir, son of Manasseh, from the clans of the people of Joseph, come near and spoke, came near and spoke to Moses before the chiefs. So they've done this before. The heads of the fathers' houses of the people of Israel, they said, the Lord commanded my Lord to give the land of inheritance by the lot to the people of Israel. And my Lord was commanded by the Lord to give the inheritance of Zelophehad, our brother, to his daughters. But if they are married to any of the sons of the other tribes of the people of Israel, then their inheritance will be taken from them through marriage. So it will be taken away from the lot of our inheritance. And when the Jubilee of the people of Israel comes, then their inheritance will be added to the inheritance of the tribe into which they marry, and their inheritance will be taken from their inheritance of the tribe of our fathers. So even if one of the daughters get a portion, through marriage they could lose it. Because that's how they saw marriage. Unfortunately, many of us don't. We don't see it the way we read the story of Adam and Eve. But they do. Verse 5, and I'll I'll bring that up later on. Verse 5, And Moses commanded the people of Israel, according to the word of the Lord, saying, So Moses kind of intervenes and says, The tribe of the people of Joseph is right. This is what the Lord commands concerning the daughters of Zelophehad. He says, Let them marry whom they think best. Only shall marry within the clan of the tribe of their father. The inheritance of the people of Israel shall not be transferred from one tribe to another. For every one of the people of Israel shall hold on to the inheritance of the tribe of his fathers. And every daughter who possesses an inheritance in the tribe of the people of Israel shall be wife to one of the clan of the tribe of her father. So that every one of the people of Israel may possess the inheritance of his fathers. So now, so no, inheritance shall be transferred from one tribe to another. For each of the tribes of the people of Israel shall hold on to its own inheritance. The daughters did as the Lord commanded. And it carries on. They were married into clans of the people of Manasseh. So they kept on to the inheritance. What's really interesting is that not only did the men really were kind of, they saw this as sacred, the land that is given to them, the inheritance of God, the inheritance of Abraham, the men saw it as sacred. But so did the women. This was special to all the people. This was sacred to all the people of God. Which is something that you don't really quite hear on. So earlier I mentioned the Garden of Eden. And this is something that was kind of not so difficult for me to really understand because one of the things that my wife and I did when we got married is we did the covenant marriage certificate. And so that meant we had to go through like eight months of marital counseling. And boy that I learn a lot. See, growing up in a place that I grew up where many households are broken, where a lot of fathers are absent for whatever reason, where mothers struggle, they're, they're, they're playing two roles at home. It was tough for me 
to understand my role. Because no one taught that to me. And then growing outside the faith, because I wasn't Christian my whole life. I got saved when I was 17 years old. This whole idea that a woman came from my rib was fairly new to me in terms of this is, this is how we segue into what marriage looks like. This is what God intended. So Genesis chapter 2. Starting with verse 18. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock, to the birds of the heavens, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he had into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taking, taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother, hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Fit for him is matching him. So equal to that, but not at the same time. Counterpart, helper. What's interesting is that this is before the fall. This is before sin entered. And once sin entered, a lot of things got twisted. Then you really had those battle of the sexist moments. Back then there wasn't. There was no worry for that. There was no need for that. Wouldn't that be something if you found out that God wanted us all to be equal under him? Matthew Henry, some of you may have known his works or commentaries. This one I came across. The woman is not made out of his head to top him. Not out of his feet to be trampled on, but out of his side to be equal with him. Under his arm to be protected and near his heart to be beloved. I know many men who don't see it that way. Some of you probably too. But what if I told you that women do have an inheritance? What if I said it wasn't just started when Christ ascended and brought us the helper, or that when Christ is with us walking, but here in Joshua 17, you see all the children of Israel, all the children of God, men and women, to have the inheritance that their forefather Abraham was promised by God. To then usher in events that would give us Jesus Christ so that all can be saved. Many issues of the day back then when Christ came, one of them was the Gentiles. Christ says, yes, them too. 
save them too. Proclaim my message to all. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Love on each other. Love on people. Pray for your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Love your wife. Love your husband. Love your children. Show it. Don't need to show it to other people because your communion in marriage is to God. He wants to see it. He wants to be there with you to experience it. Some significant women in the Bible God wasn't just after the men and the children. He's also after the women to help bring upon the works of Christ to spread it throughout all nations. We have here at the first Eve. In Genesis 3.20, Adam names her mother of all living, or all living creatures, or all living animals. Sarah Mother of Nations, Rebecca, perhaps the first woman at the well story. If you're reading Old Testament, you know there are many incidents where, or events where women are found doing stuff at the well and someone sees them. You see it with Jesus Christ. You see it with Moses. You see it with other people in the Bible. Miriam. Now this one, these three women here, prophetesses. Deborah, we covered a couple weeks ago, I think, or two weeks ago. Judge of Israel. Before she was a judge, she was, always, she was already prophetizing. Hulda, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing her right, Hulda. She actually, interesting story with her, I believe King Josiah, one of the Josiahs in Judah, they found Deuteronomy and they found out they were living the law wrongfully. So they said, we got to go to the temple and figure this out. Hulda shows up, and she gives them this whole, she rings their ear. She, She gives it to the king, to his people. She had already been prophetizing. In New Testament, we see Paul. Paul's greeting in Romans 16. He's given appreciation and greetings to all his people, to those who help him church plant, help him with his ministry, help him within the church of Rome. Just a couple here, Phoebe, Priscilla, Junia, a lot others there, including marital couples. If you got the time to take, use it to read Romans 16. It's really interesting. It's kind of like a bunch of people in a family of church working together to further the kingdom. And of course, Matthew's genealogy and Matthew 1. We have here Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, and Mary. Women of significance and a place where culturally the men dominated that atmosphere. These were women at certain points in the history of God that were there at these critical moments to show us what faith is all about, to show us what God is doing in God's character. So Jesus fulfills. We no longer need to go to the temple like they did back in the Old Testament. Christ becomes that sacrifice we need. And if you were here for Pastor Anthony's message this morning, you would know. Christ was that temple for us. Christ was that great shepherd for us. Christ was the king that we needed to break us free of our own entrapments that keep us slaved to sin. I'm going to read really quickly now, uh, 1 Corinthians chapters 3 and uh, 6 here. Not the whole thing, just segments. Um, I covered this a couple weeks ago, and it just keeps coming back. So if you weren't here then, you're here now, you're going to get some of it. So 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting with verse 16. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? 
Verse 17, if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Speaking to everybody. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. God dwells in believers. You're now that walking vessel, that Ark of the Covenant, that King David will trail in front of his armies to win battles that is in you, that Holy Spirit. God's Spirit is in you. Do not be fearful. You're not a slave to sin. God is your almighty Lord. And throughout the history of that is given to us in the Bible, time and time again, God comes through for his people, whether you're man, child, or woman. It is by faith that we are saved, by sacrifice, by his blood, that we are given that inheritance of his holy kingdom. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for your message, Lord. Thank you for your scripture, Lord. Lord, thank you for all those people in the Bible, Lord, that that you used, that we read about and we have our own character studies on, Lord. Thank you for for them. and Thank you for showing us that they're not perfect, that it's you who is perfect, Lord. Lord, I pray for all the men and women here today, Lord, that by love we show each other respect. By love we obey you, Lord. In faith, Lord, are your promises given to us, Lord, that we act out being Christian. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.